together and encourage one another and just enjoy being together. That's what a family is all about. Just coming together, having one common bond. Being of one accord, the Bible would say. And that's because Christ is the head and we're his bride. I love the song set that we did today and all those songs that we were just talking about being the bride of Christ and being ready. And I love that song that we, we kind of uh, sang early on, brings back to mind kind of our, our theme for last year's revival. The Lord's coming back. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Let's be ready for him. And I hope that uh, you've been preparing today for this time of worship we've experienced. And what we're going to do is we study his word. I don't know how many of you have looked at the emails this past week, but I sent you out one telling you who we'll be looking at this coming week. And uh, so hopefully you've read through uh, the book of Judges. Chapter 6, 7, and 8 talks about a man named Gideon. And the story of Gideon is a fascinating story. And once again, God's Word is filled with people that are ordinary, just like you and I. People who have the same fears that we have. People who have the same doubts that we have. People who are broken and cast out by the world, but God uses to do some great things, and Gideon's life is one of those stories. I'd like for you to turn with me in the book of Judges, that Old Testament book. And in the book of Judges, up until this point in the sixth chapter, there have been four other judges that God has raised up from his people. And it seems like every time God raises up a judge, someone to be the leader of his people, not a king, but a, but a leader, that after they die, that the people just fall back into their old ways. And the same is true here. The fourth judge has been dead for some time. And I want you to read with me starting in verse 1 of chapter 6. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So get this for a second. God's people had turned away from him. And then God allowed another group of people to come in and take over their land to come in and cast them out. And now the once proud people of God, the once who was going to be his chosen people, his royal priesthood, has now been vanquished out of the land flowing in milk and honey, and now they're up in the caves. They're just living in old, old caves and in the rocky cliffs, a place where they're semi-protected. That's what we see. It's a shame because they could have stayed with God, putting him first in their life and been protected. But since they abandoned him and said, God, we, we don't want to follow you anymore. We like it our way. We're, we're too sophisticated for you. We, we're, we're knowledgeable now. We're not like our grandparents and great-grandparents, old-fashioned. We've come up in the world. We don't need you any longer. And God says, okay, all right. And then his enemies the Midianites came and took over, and they're living in the cliffs. So it was, whenever Israel had sown, whenever they planted their crops, the Midianites would come up. Also, the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them, and they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no substance for Israel, neither sheep nor oxen nor donkeys. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So the scene is, the Midianites come in, and they're just so vast in number. It's like a swarm of locusts coming in and just devouring everything. And when they leave, everything is destroyed. There's no crops left for the Israelites. There's no animals left. It's, they've taken everything. And so in their moment of need, they cry out to God. Aren't we so like them? Aren't we so like them? We, 
we say we want it our way, and when we get our way, <laughs> which usually winds up in destruction, we fall to our knees and we cry out to God. God, save us. And God hears their cry. Let's keep reading. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and I brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the hand of all who oppressed you, and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. You see, they're starving to death. And they cry out to the Lord, Lord, save us. And he hears their cry. Why were they starving? Because the adversary had came in and took away their livelihood. He took away their nourishment. They had become hungry. And they become weak. And they know they can't survive much longer without the Lord, so they call on him. You know, the tactics of the Amorites and the, um, the other people from the east that we read about there and the Midianites, their attack is the same as Satan today. Oh, Satan today may not come in and take your garden. He may not come in and take your livestock, cause things like that to happen, but he still starves God's people to death. And how may he do that, you're asking. I, I'm, I'm full today. I, I had a big breakfast. How am I starving? How is Satan starving me? Well, let me tell you something. We are called Christians if you're in Christ. And how are Christians supposed to be nourished? How are we to be fed? It's not from Hardee's, you know, even though I like their biscuits. It's not from Subway, even though I love when they put their footlongs on special. How are we to be fed the Word? We are to be fed by the Word of God. Now, let me ask you a question, and I don't want you to raise your hand because I like you too much to embarrass you. Are you feeding on God's Word? If you had to survive physically with as much as you consume spiritually, How would you be doing? Would you be strong? Would you have the nourishment to go out and fight the battles that you know are all around you? Spiritually speaking, Satan is starving God's people to death by keeping them from God's word. And how, you ask, is he doing that? Well, let me ask you for a moment. When you get home in the evening, we all have to work. But when you get off work and you go home in the evening, what's some of the things that we tend to do? We tend to plop down on the couch or in the recliner, and we pick up that little remote control and we flip that TV on. And we feast on TV, don't we? We feast on the internet, on our computers, our iPads, our tablets, our smartphones. We feast and gorge ourselves on all of this thing that's just hollow calories, <laughs> empty. It might give you something to do, but it certainly doesn't prepare you for the battles that's out there waging, does it? Does it? So, the time that we used to spend decades ago reading God's Word, learning about what He wants out of our life, we've replaced that. I've heard a long time ago, and I think it's pretty, pretty good, a pretty good saying, if, if Satan can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. So the times that we would spend as a family encouraging one another, praying with one another, reading God's Word together has been replaced with 
baseball, television, Netflix, Google, all kinds of things. Facebook, oh man, somebody said he's meddling now. Can you imagine for just one minute, and I'm preaching to Tim here because, you know, it's easy for Tim to fall into that trap too. It really is. Clash of Clans, Boom Beach, all kinds of little games that you just play for hours and hours and you could have done something productive. Hey, I am sitting in the pew with you hearing God speak to us today. We're starving to death. The people were being starved out by God's enemy. And they cried out to him, and God says, I hear you, but I want to remind you, I was with you. I brought you out of all of this mess that you're in now, and you turned and went back to it. Let's listen to him. Let's hear his cry. Let's, let's leave these idols that are around us. And, and yeah, we don't have idols like they had here today. You know what God was talking about? I, I told you not to be around those gods of Ammon and Midian. Don't, don't fear their gods. They're nothing. But what, what have you done? You went and started bowing down to them and worshiping them. We worship our entertainment. We worship all the things that we, we do that takes up our time. And if you really want to know what the God of your life is, do two things. Look at your financial statement. See where your money's going. And no, this isn't a plea to get you to give to the church. I'm telling you, as an inventory, to see what's important to you, see where your money's going. And then secondly, look at your time. And see where your time is spent. How much of it is spent with God, doing the work of God, the things of God, to build up his kingdom? How much time is spent with that? Well, in this case, there was none. And God said, I want to remind you where you come from. And look at what he says next in verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and said unto the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah. Now remember, Guys, if you're reading this in your Bible, this isn't Oprah. I'm not talking about Oprah Winfrey here. There's not a tree named after Oprah. This is Ophrah. The trees which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash. And while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Now get the scene. Here we find this man Gideon. He is in the wine press area threshing his wheat. Now, we've already heard how the Midianites, the Amorites, and the people of the east would come in when the crops were ready to be harvested and they would destroy everything. Well, Gideon's here and he's hiding at the wine press area because the grape season, the time for harvesting the grapes was different than the time for the wheat. The, the enemies of God's people would have been going into the fields where the wheat was, but they wouldn't think about going into the hill country where the grapes were. It wasn't time to get any of those. So Gideon's there, and he's hiding, threshing the wheat. And this angel of the Lord appears to him. And did you see the salutation that he gave him? He said, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Now, let's look at Gideon just for a second. Gideon, his name actually translates lumberjack. Lumberjack. Um, probably a more literal translation would be the faller of trees. That's what a lumberjack does, right? He cuts down trees. Gideon means he who cuts to pieces the trees. He's, he's a man who uh, spends a lot of time outside and in the woods. And here he is hiding from God's people. And the, and the angel says, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. And when he hears this salutation, it's as if he's been thinking, as he's been threshing that wheat. Oh, man, I cannot believe I'm up here in this wine press having to hide 
looking up over to see if any of the Midianites are coming, any of the Amalekites around. No, I can't believe it. I remember dads telling me about how we were once a proud people, how once we were strong, how God fought our battles for us. And man, I can't believe I'm up here hiding. And then the angel says, greetings, mighty man of valor. God is with you. And look at his response. Gideon said to him, O oh Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Gideon saying, if God's with us, where is he now? Again, isn't that so like us? You know, Gideon should have known that his people had forsaken God. They had bowed down and worshipped the idols of their enemies as God. And for seven years, worshiping those idols have gotten them nowhere, has it? But Gideon's saying, if God's with us, why are we in this mess? Why do we not see the miracles that we once saw? Friends, that's a lesson for us here in 2016 America. We have the talking heads on TV saying, Oh, we've got to have gun control. We've got to have more strict regulations on guns. Ban ammunition. Ban this. Have a law for this. Have a law for that. And never once does anyone get up there on TV and saying, we have taken God out of our schools. We've taken him out of our government. And now we're getting exactly what we deserve. We don't see that, do we? We don't see anyone standing up. We need a mighty man of valor to stand up and say we've got to put God back if we want to have a different outcome than we're having now. Is it any wonder our kids don't mind taking another's life? They've been taught they've just evolved from nothing. You do whatever feels good. Take whatever you want. Just don't get caught. Tell whatever tale you need to tell so that you don't get in trouble. And we wonder why we're in this situation. Just don't be like Gideon and forget we're in this situation because we're taking God out of everything else. And God says, you want me out of America? Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to get political, but I was telling my brother, we have the same talk. Man, my brother Lane, his ears burn up because I'm burning him up. I only get to see him a couple times a year, and boy, we're talking. Me and him have a lot of the same philosophies. But there was a T-shirt that came out about six and a half years ago, and there's a picture of George Bush, and he's throwing a little hand up, and he says, Miss me yet? <laughs> you know, it's as if God is waving to us in America and saying, Do you miss me yet? I miss him, don't you? We need him. And so Gideon has been given this call. You're a mighty man of valor. I'm going to do some good things with you. God is calling him out. God's calling him a mighty warrior. God calls us saints if we're in Christ. We've been called a saint. You may not feel like a saint, but if you're in Christ, that's who you are. You are a saint of of God and he's called you out to be this and he will never call you to do something that he's not there to help you. Gideon is a man though that he's got a low estimation of himself and that's a good thing. Notice I didn't say he had low self-esteem. There are people who beat themselves up saying, well, I ain't good enough for this. I ain't good enough for that. That's not who Gideon was, but he did understand who he was. Look at this next verse. Verse 14 through 16. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? 
So he said to him, O Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. He's saying, Lord, how can you use me? I mean, my clan is weak and poor, and I'm the poorest of my clan. I'm the weakest of my clan. What can I do? But look at what the answer is. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Surely I will be with you. Doesn't that sound like what Christ told us? As he went back into heaven to prepare a place for us, he said, I want you to go into all the world and to make disciples. I want you to teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he said, and I am with you to the very end of the age. God is still with us. I don't know what your call is. I don't know what your battle is that God has has primed you for. But I can assure you there's a battle that you need to fight. And God needs warriors, mighty people of valor who are not afraid to fight, who are not ashamed to get their hands dirty, to get a little sweat. You know, people think sweat is a bad thing. People think work is a four-letter word we don't want to talk about. But God asked us to work in his fields. It's a privilege to work for him. And so God gives the call, and then he says, I'm going to be with you. He'll never send us where he's not willing to go. And I'm going to close this down real quickly. Hopefully you've read it. But Gideon, Gideon goes out with this commission. He's going to defeat these Midianites. They have amassed in the valley. Now, they, they've come, and the time for the harvest for the Hebrews is here. So all of these people, that's the enemies of God, have gathered together. And again, their numbers are so vast, you can't count them all. A big army of people. And Gideon's been primed to go in and to, to rout those people, to get them out of God's people's area, to send them away forever. And so Gideon says, Lord, I know you've called me, but whew, that's a lot of people I'm going to have to fight. Can you give me a sign just, just to make sure that I, I'm not just, just going crazy here? I'm going to take this piece of cloth, and I'm going to put it outside of my tent. And in the morning, would you let all the ground around it be dry, but let that cloth be wet? Then I'll know when I come out, and it's like that, that you are who you say you are, and I'm called to do this work. The next morning, he opens the door or opens the tent, and he goes outside. Sure enough, the ground all around it is dry. The piece of fabric is wet. He wrings out about a bowl full of moisture from that. And it should have been enough confirmation, but the, the adversary did to Gideon the same thing he does to us. He kind of planted doubt. And Gideon... What you're about to do is a, it's suicide. You, ain't no way you can go up against these people with 300. This, there's too many of them. They're too big. They're too strong. They're too prepared. That mountain is too high to climb. You can't do it. And so that seed of doubt was planted in Gideon's mind. And I don't know why the God of heaven let him do this, but Gideon goes back to the Lord and says, Lord, I, I, I hate to have to do this. But just to make sure, this time, can I, can I leave that cloth out overnight? And this time, let the ground all around it be wet, but that cloth be dry. And the Lord permits that. The next morning, Gideon opens that tent door and goes outside, and sure enough, the ground around it, the dew was thick. It was wet everywhere, but the cloth was bone dry. And Gideon knew that that was the God of heaven who had called him to do battle for him. And he went out and did battle. Against unbelievable odds, God used him to do a miracle. Now, friends, God is not limited on miracles. He's not limited on miracles. 
He has got an overabundant amount of miracles available. What God's limited on is people to work through. Saints that he has called to come and work in his fields. That's the only limitation he has today. For we are his hands and feet. The church is his body to do his work here on earth until he comes back. So church, we need to get busy. We need to serve him while there's time. And you know what happens when the church gets busy? When the church does its work? The world sees the church doing good in the world and they give glory to God. It's just like what Jesus promised us. I want to read one last passage in closing. In closing. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Jesus says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. They may see your good works and glorify God. Church, the world needs to see Jesus in action. And it's up to us to show him to the world. It's so interesting to see that first salutation that was given to Gideon. Mighty man of valor. Gideon didn't think it was possible. He didn't think that God could use someone like him. But do you know that Gideon became exactly who God said he would be? A mighty man of valor. Whatever God is calling you to be, maybe maybe a, a mother to a bunch of kids, maybe a leader in his church, maybe just a good neighbor to look after those who are less fortunate around you. Whatever he's called you to be, be that miracle for someone else. Let God use you, and I know he will.